Before we start this episode, I'd like to thank you on behalf of Empowering Conversations team for allowing us in your homes and, of course, in your hearts. Your clicks to like the episodes and to share them on social media, your suggestions to improve, your notes of encouragement, and your reviews gave us the energy we needed to continue. We truly could have not done it without you. And I hope we were able to bring a little encouragement, a little wisdom, and a little joy in this very odd year to you. And I hope 2021 brings all of us on this planet Earth health, joy, prosperity, and of course, inclusivity. Compassionately yours, Mehran. He can't hear this interview, but because of his courage and innate desire to educate, he will teach us many important lessons today. This week, my guest is Dr. Ruzbe Gahraman, an immigrant from Iran who will share with you what it is like to be deaf and migrate and go on and to earn a PhD in special education. He will talk about his journey, the obstacles, the learnings, and the triumph he experienced as a minority in Canada, and of course, how the two countries differed in terms of supporting his growth. Here I have to make a side note. Ruzbe shared his experiences in writing, and I'm reading it for you. So go ahead, grab your cup of tea, and join me in this very enlightening episode of Empowering Conversations with an Immigrant. Hello and welcome to the Empowering Conversations podcast, a place to get inspired, challenged, and empowered by stories of immigrants who build their success from zero. I'm your host, Mehran. I was born deaf in an educated family. My dad was a well-known poet and researcher in Persian literature, and my mom a well-known retired teacher of deaf for 30 years. I remember feeling lonely because I saw moving lips, but I had no idea what was said. I felt frustrated and isolated until I attended the kindergarten for deaf. That's where I found others who were like me. I was happy. There, I learned different words like water, mom, dad, and it felt good. It felt good to communicate with others. For the next 12 years, I attended school for deaf. For college, I was accepted for agricultural engineering and attended university alongside hearing students. It was difficult to be a deaf student in an unaccommodating university setting in Iran. The instructors walked frequently and turned their back toward me to write on the board or they walked around as they spoke. Taking notes in that setting was very difficult, but regardless, I was able to graduate as one of the top five students in my class. After graduation, I worked one year in the industry, but I realized that the career really didn't fit me, as I had to communicate with the farmers. You can imagine how that go. So I switched majors, and earned my teaching credentials to be able to teach in the same school I attended. While teaching there, I completed my master's degree in history and applied for a PhD. For those of your audience who are not aware of the process in Iran, to start a PhD program, one has to take an entrance exam and be interviewed by a panel of advisors. I was accepted in the entrance exam, but during my second round of interview, I got rejected, simply because one of the interviewers found out I was deaf. I was crushed. I never thought of deafness as a limitation for my growth. In Iran, I had many contributions. As an active member of a research group of Farsi and Persian Sign Language, or PSL, at University of Social Welfare and Rehabilitation Sciences, we published a dictionary of Farsi words and signs in 1999. 
I authored several articles, including sign language studies for the first encyclopedia of deaf in Iran. After years of research, analysis, and evaluation, we published an encyclopedia with three volumes. That totaled over 1,400 pages in 2005. Honestly speaking, my rejection for a PhD program was a turning point, both for me and my family. And that was pretty much when my wife and I decided to move to Canada. Once in Canada, I attended University of Alberta and completed my master's degree in special education with a focus on deaf education and completed all the required courses in special education and received my Ph.D. there. For the past decade, I've been teaching various courses such as Introduction to Deaf Studies, Deaf Education, courses focused in providing pre-service teachers with an understanding of the educational need of deaf and hard of hearing students, ASL, Deaf Culture, and English as Second Language to Deaf Newcomers in Canada. I remember having several deaf students from Syria, and to teach them ASL, I had to get them engaged first. I communicated with them by using gestures. I learned the language they used at their home first, and then I tried to find the same meaning in the second sign language, which for our case was American Sign Language or ASL. It was a lengthy process and perhaps much longer compared to hearing students learning a second language. But this experience and others provided me with an excellent opportunity to act as a deaf role model, both for my deaf students as well as the hearing ones. I taught them about language and culture. I love what I do. And I was recognized for it by Graduate Student Association at University of Alberta some time ago. And earlier you asked me, how would people describe me? And I say, I wake up in the early mornings and I prepare everything in advance before I start to teach. I'm an organized person and I'm, and I'm on time. Three words that describe me as a university instructor are confidence, pride, and excitement. When I asked him about his biggest challenges he faced, he said, My biggest challenges were language, social norms, and the laws. First, I had to learn two new languages, English and American Sign Language. That meant double the challenge in terms of language in comparison with hearing immigrants. For that, I attended college and used TV programs and many other resources available for deaf. Another difficulty was learning social norms, what's appropriate or acceptable versus what's inappropriate or unacceptable. And because my ears were not able to hear in the society, it was hard to learn in the new country. For example, it's a challenge to reduce the level of noise as I walk, as I eat, or as I drink, because I can't hear my own voice. This is part of deaf culture and something to be accepted. But this understanding can be hard for some, and that's something I teach my hearing students in the university. At the same time, I try to learn those norms and reduce the amount of noise I make. And for that, I checked with others, I asked, I read, and I researched. Another thing was the laws in Canada. They were very different compared to my homeland, Iran. And sometimes I felt like I was on the back of other people, keep asking them about what I didn't know. In that case, internet was a great resource, and thanks to my community, I, I became more and more familiar with the Canadian laws and learned a lot here. If I may add another one, it's been finding a suitable job. Ableism is an obstacle that we deaf people and other groups of disabled people face often, especially when looking for a job. 
the hearing immigrants do not have that kind of obstacles. Jobs are limited for us, and during recessions and budget cuts like now, less assistance is provided to us, which means our jobs will be heavily impacted. As you know, I'm a university professor, and I need an interpreter to teach, which means added costs for the colleges or any organization that hires someone like me, right? So as I mentioned, it's easier to cut hours from us compared to others. But as you know by now, I'm driven. I update my resume regularly. I attend workshop and seminars to learn new skills. Here, if I may add an advice to the new immigrants in your audience, I would say, learn the language in conversation as well as the social norms in the first months of. Your immigration, because these will allow you to build relationships with the new environment smoothly, and reduce the amount of stress you and your family feels. Plus, it reduces many misunderstandings that could happen because of not knowing the language or the culture. I put on my noise canceling headphone. And for 15 minutes, I sit in absolute silence. I zip my lips, and every time my son talks to me, I read his lips and respond by writing. Life becomes a little different, but not impossible. Deafness is within our minds. Sure, I couldn't listen to the music the same way, but I still had two capable hands. And a sharp eyesight, more attuned to movements. I invite you to sit at your silence and experience the world the way Ruzbe and other deaf individuals experience, and be reminded that every one of us experiences our world differently. And I hope this episode increases our understanding and help us focus on our similarities rather than our differences. Did you always wanted to be a university instructor, or there were limitations for your growth, as far as your career choices goes? I always wanted to be a university instructor, but as a child, I also liked to be a pilot. Now I'm happy I didn't. I love my job, and I'm proud of who I am, which makes me confident about what I teach to my community. I love how I'm a role model for many deaf students and others. In 2002, I completed my international leadership certificate in Japan, where I stayed for two months to take several courses in leadership using international sign, and of course the Japanese sign language. My aspirations were to teach leadership skills to my students, and I do that today in the university setting. Can you teach me one of the leadership skills that you teach your students? Sure. Set your goal in the first place. Doing any action without a goal to me is a failure. Many people go about life with that goal in mind, and I'm happy and I'm thankful that I've always had a goal for each step of the way, both in my daily life as well as my work. And I always encourage people around me to set goals and honor that in life. Going back to your question on my growth, I have never felt there was a cap on my growth because I have good problem-solving skills from childhood. I might have a limitation of language and communication, but I always found a way to solve the problems that I faced. For example, I never had the sign language interpreter services in the university as a student in Iran. I was the only deaf student in the class of 35 to 40 hearing students, and I had difficulty understanding the professors in the classroom, as we discussed earlier. But my academic performance marks were often A, because I found many ways to cover what I missed in the class. Here in Canada, I was surprised to learn about the rights that a deaf person has for using the sign language interpreter. 
Believe it or not, I like the independency I had back home, despite how it opens new doors and makes certain things happen easier. In general, it's hard to believe someone is oppressed because of lack of an interpreter or because they can't hear. To me, limitation is in our belief. Then I asked him about his wife and how they communicated with one another, and that's when the conversation took a new turn. So out of curiosity, how do you communicate with your wife? I think the words that come from our hearts are more powerful than those from our lips. We read each other's lips. I use Persian Sign Language as well, but she didn't show any interest in learning sign language, and that was okay. There are many ways to communicate, and except for hearing, we can do almost everything else that you or someone who can hear does. She was great at reading lips, and if she was out and needed other ways to communicate, she either wrote notes or used an oral interpreter here in Canada. All we need is someone who's patient and talks slowly. Other than that, we don't need anything else to understand others or to communicate with them. So your wife was also deaf? Yes, she was born deaf like myself. As we chat the other day, you have a young daughter. How about her? A beautiful daughter can hear. She speaks Farsi, English, and French, as well as American Sign Language. I'm so proud of her. She's attending Toronto University and can comfortably switch from other languages to American Sign Language if need to. A few weeks back, when she talked to me about my mom, she signed mom in Persian Sign Language. I was so touched because it's been over 18 years since she last used it in Iran. She's very bright. And that was when I thought to myself, if she has a bit of her dad's determination, she's set for life. Then being a career coach, I was curious about work conditions, so I asked Ruz Bey about his work and getting his first job in Canada. Prior to our migration, I built few connections with deaf community in Toronto. That enabled me to find a job much quicker compared to my wife. Given her interest to work with math and numbers in an office setting, she started applying for office work, and to me, the competition was fierce for her compared to me. But also, she had more options. I think in any setting, it's a give and take, right? But as I mentioned earlier, learning language and communicating was hard. Not only I had to learn English, but also I had to learn American Sign Language. And I did, actually pretty quickly. I didn't go to any classes. I learned from books, educational videos, and conversations with members of deaf community in Toronto. We used to meet once a week, and after about two months, not only I learned American Sign Language, but also prepared for job interview. In total, I know three sign languages, and for none, I took classes. So I guess I'm good at learning languages. But to learn English, books and videos were not enough. I took courses at George Brown College with those who could hear and was able to finish my coursework in about nine months. Many take two to four years to finish the same curriculum, but I was fast. For the classes, I had two interpreters that worked closely with me. They switched spots every 15 to 20 minutes, but they were essential in helping me. For my wife, the school provided a typist because she didn't know sign language. These resources were not something either of us had in Iran, and we are very thankful that Canada provided these resources for us because they were really important and we were really grateful for them. I remember in Iran, we had difficulty lip reading the teachers. Sometimes we only understood about 30% of the class content and the rest were either guessed or read classmates' notes and studied textbooks. It was hard there. 
Did you know there are over 300 sign languages? And for example, British Sign Language and American Sign Language have only 31% identical signs. According to some learning, American Sign Language is similar to that of spoken French. One need to study about two to six years to be fluent in ASL. This should give us a better sense of appreciation for Ruse Bay and other deaf in our community. So next time you see a deaf, congratulate them on the extra mile they have gone in order to be where they are at. And feel free to share this episode with those who complain that learning English is hard and they can't do it. Coaching tip. You can do anything you put your mind into. As Ruse Bay mentioned, the disability is in our mind. It was then that I had to confess and ask him to educate me on something very important. According to World Health Organization, there are over 466 million deaf around the world. This is over 5% of world's population. Despite this huge population, many of us are still unaware of the correct terms to be used for someone like you. I remember the first time that I contacted you. I tried my best to not use any terms because I simply didn't know what to say, how to call you. It was after you called yourself deaf several times that I learned what's okay and what's not. Can you please educate me and our audience on what's acceptable and what's not? Thanks for asking that. Over the years, different terms such as deaf and dumb, deaf mutes, hearing impairment, and loss of hearing have been used to refer to deaf. These terms are offensive today and should not be used by public, especially deaf and dumb and deaf mute. The terms hearing impaired or deaf and hard of hearing and loss of hearing have been used by public institutions and political groups as an inclusive term that focuses on what's lacking or lost. Many deaf people, including myself, prefer to be just called deaf. Deaf with a capital D, because it focuses on our identity, for which we have culture and language. At times we feel oppressed and treated unfairly both here and in Iran. And if I may, I'd like to use this opportunity to educate our audience on a few terms. Autism is when someone discriminates or show prejudice against individuals who are deaf or have difficulty hearing. Although the term was coined when I was only three years old in 1975 by Tom Humphreys, a deaf scholar, our community have been experiencing these prejudices for centuries. It is when someone believes that we are unable to perform a task behave a certain way, or learn as well as others can, and often it is mixed with attitude of thinking one is superior to the deaf, or they feel that deafness is a tragedy. I personally did some research in 2012 regarding autism, and like Richard Eckert, a sociologist and expert in the area of autism, I believe deaf experience discrimination throughout their life, especially during childhood from their family members, teachers, educators, physicians, audiologists, and more. Most of these people are hearing and don't have a complete understanding of the deaf. In many cases, they push deaf students or kids to attend schools aimed for hearing students so that there will be no difference between hearing and non-hearing students. This is due to their lack of understanding of the deaf culture because there is and there will be some differences. To us, many people in our communities lack the understanding or the willingness to accommodate those who cannot hear. And if we were to divide their reactions when they interact with someone who's deaf like myself, there are two groups. First group is the one who assumes that deaf people should be encouraged or even forced to be like those who can hear 
while the second group assumes control of the deaf. And this empowers them by making their decisions regarding different aspects of their life without much of an input from the deaf person or their community. To us, autism is as unacceptable as sexism, racism, and other forms of discrimination and bigotry. Unfortunately, the famous person that you and your audience know, Alexander Graham Bell, is one of the pioneers of autism. That's why the deaf community hate him so much. Although born to a deaf mother and married to one, he detested deaf community very much. He used many strategies to limit deaf club activities or the use of sign language in deaf education centers. He even worked against immigration of deaf to the States, even though he himself was a Scottish immigrant. He also worked hard to limit marriage of deaf with one another or with hearing individuals so their genes don't pass on. It is known that he made the phone to interact with his mom and his wife, but at the end it turned out useless for them. Instead, it helped hearing individuals and transformed their lives. I personally have never used a phone, as you might imagine, but I ask others to use it for me on my behalf to call someone to ask a question or check on friends. But in general, I don't like the phone because it makes me dependent on someone else. On the other hand, I like video conversations because it is not only useful for hearing people, but it also useful for someone like me. Then I asked him about his personal experience regarding discrimination. Have you ever been discriminated against personally? Like, have you ever felt the discrimination and you have examples to share with our audience? Yes, many times. Many times I had to act like hearing individuals, both in Iran and in Canada. This is a problem with the world and not limited to a place. However, there have been many activities to increase community awareness regarding autism. Just like any other isms like sexism, racism, it starts with us. So we need to be aware and we need to learn. In Iran, I had people who asked me whether I could drive or not. Or when I was getting married, some made comments like, how can you marry someone who's deaf also? How can you hear your infant cry or how can you tend to them promptly? Here in Canada, many doubt my ability to teach hearing students or in many cases, once the hiring manager knows I'm deaf and require additional services, uh, disregard my resume without looking at my experiences and my abilities. But to me, there's a solution to everything. My wife and I communicated easily, as I told you before, and for our infant, we use baby monitors that vibrate or their lights turn on when a baby cry. We never had any difficulty. It's the same thing we use for the doorbell. People make a big deal out of it when it really isn't. In general, deafness is an invisible disability because you can't tell someone by their looks if they are deaf or not. People discriminate when they understand someone is deaf. So it is important to raise that awareness and teach people about the rights that the deaf have and ways to reduce the discrimination we experience. What did you wish people did for you? In other words, what did you wish our audience knew and could do for someone like you. I don't like others pity on me. I'm a capable individual and don't want to be helped beyond my needs. The looks, the words sometimes hurt, especially if someone questions our ability. Instead, I wish people were more aware of our culture and our language. Our culture has been passed on generations, and this is what brings the deaf people close together. And unlike other cultures, it's not based on geographic proximity or place of birth. What unites us is the use of sign language, although by itself there are many sign languages around the world. 
What would you say are some cultural differences between people around the world? We live not as a deaf, but as people who share the culture and language. Therefore, those who want to learn a sign language should learn deaf culture too. Deaf culture is important because it allows individuals to be who they are and live in a way that is unique to them. There's more to a person than whether they hear or not. So let's not just focus on their ears. The body language and facial expressions used by people in a hearing culture are subconscious and sometimes misleading, whereas in a deaf culture, these body movements and facial expressions are part of their conscious communication. A culture of a group includes the identity, the norms, the traditions, values, and the languages of a group, and there is not much cultural difference between deaf people around the world. For example, when we are getting someone's attention, we tap on their shoulder. We wave or use an intermediary. And that's similar for the deaf around the world. I highly recommend you and everyone in your audience to read the book Deaf Gain, Raising the Stakes of Humanity and Diversity by Dirksen, Bahan, and Moray. One of the reasons I love this book is because it's written mainly from the perspective of deaf community with a focus on advantages of deafness and shares the potential benefits of deafness. It's a great read. I was beyond thankful to Ruzbe for his willingness to share his story with me. Ruzbe opened my eyes to many things that I was oblivious to, how to interact with a deaf individual, their challenges, and what to appreciate, especially as a minority immigrant. I don't know about you, but I knew little about Graham Bell and autism. And I'm curious to learn more about it, as well as deaf culture and the advantage of being deaf. In the show notes, I will include the link to the book and other resources Ruth Bay shared with me. If this is the first time you're tuning in, make sure you subscribe to our channel and our mailing list so that you get notified when episodes like this one airs. As always, thank you for listening and thank you for sharing this episode of Empowering Conversations with your friends and your community. And of course, thank you for writing us a review on iTunes. And a note to a friend who left us a one-star review, thank you for taking the time. And I wish you wrote how we could improve our show because as my listeners know, I'm passionate about this work. Thank you again and don't forget to stay home Stay safe and listen to the past 26 episodes of Empowering Conversations. Happy Holidays.